everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Oh Shoot. I'm very excited for today's episode. If you read the title, we are talking about using a flash. And I had an episode like forever ago that I did on flash, but I kind of wanted to revisit the topic and kind of like let you guys know how me using the flash has been going for the past like over a year that I've been experimenting with flash. So I feel like I have a little bit more experience and I just want to share some love with you guys and share some flash tips because honestly, when I am like posting on Instagram or TikTok, the question that I constantly get is like, how do I use my flash? Like what are tips for using flash, whatever. So that's what we're going to do today. That's what we're going to talk about. It's going to be a good episode. Um, I obviously have to update you guys on my life and what's going on. So I feel like right now I am like in the middle of like the lowest of winter right now. And I'm really feeling it. Like I just feel kind of unmotivated and tired all the time like can't get out of bed I like don't want to go do stuff because I'm just like man I am so just down in the dumps because of winter right now and I feel like it comes in waves too but um so that's kind of like how I'm feeling motivation wise I feel like January is always so hard for me but I know that it's only gonna go up from here like you know, as we get into February, I have like trips in February, and March. I just feel like January has been kind of like not very exciting because I haven't really had too much going on. So that's how I'm feeling. And honestly, like because of that, it's like hard to work sometimes. And I'm just like, I don't know. I just I'm really feeling the whole like being your own boss thing. I'm really feeling that this month. I'm like, I don't want to do anything. I don't want to work. And I honestly think that like the holidays has impacted like how I feel during January because I had like literally like two weeks of like doing nothing. It was like over two weeks where I like wasn't working. And so I kind of just got in this habit of like not working. So it's been interesting. I'm definitely on the up, but I feel like January has just been like not my friend, you know what I'm saying? Um, besides that, I um, got a Dyson Airwrap, but it's not a Dyson Airwrap. It's a Shark Flex style. And it basically is the same thing as the Dyson Airwrap, but it's like half the cost. So I just use it today. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my hair is like kind of curled back. And um I'll have to post some like of my feelings about it. It's super fun to use, but yeah, it just, it's a very exciting life update for me because I love doing my hair and kind of like blowing it out. And so this is like a a nice fun change for me, like just a different way for me to do my hair basically. Um, The other thing I wanted to say, and it's more just like an interesting social media observation for me, I this past weekend just like stopped posting stories. Like I literally went like, think I think like three full days without posting a single story to my Instagram stories. And that's kind of rare for me because I feel like I'm always trying to post at least something on my story, but I let all of my stories die. And then on, I think it was like Saturday, like one of the days I literally just posted one thing to my story and it was like, literally just like random and I didn't think anything of it because it was just one picture and then the next day I went back and posted like two more things and the picture that I posted on Saturday the one picture literally had like the top amount of views I've ever had for any story ever it was like in like the 19,000 range of views which normally I'm like I get like 10,000 views per story, but like 19,000, I literally doubled my number because I let all of my Instagram stories die. So I kind of think it's an important lesson. I've always lived by the idea of needing to 
always have something on your Instagram story, like in case like a new client comes and like wants to see like what your brand is about, like they need to be able to see your stories. Like you need to always have stories up. But I think kind of giving myself that reset was really healthy for my account because now like I've been posting stories pretty consistently since then. And honestly, like I have been getting amazing story views. So if you're someone that is kind of struggling with views and you are constantly posting on your story, maybe give it a try and just like stop posting for like two or three days and then go back and post on your story again. I just, I don't know why, but it worked and I was literally dumbfounded I just it just didn't it doesn't make sense in my head like I feel like the people who are constantly posting the story should be rewarded because you're always using the app but I do kind of understand there's like a sense of overusing a feature and like almost putting out too much content to the point where people are just like bored and you know whatever so That's a little interesting social media observation for you. Um, Another thing that I've observed recently is I'm just talking about social media right now, but for TikTok, I've noticed that like TikTok does not um, punish you for posting multiple times a day. And I feel like Instagram does like Instagram doesn't like when you post like more than one reel a day or more than one feed post in a day, but TikTok, like it's like the more the merrier. I will post like three videos a day and I'll get like my normal views on every single video, if not more. So it's very interesting um, how TikTok is nowadays. If you're a photographer and you are just like, how do I use TikTok? My biggest recommendation is to set up five different like types of videos that you like posting. So Um, for example, these are kind of the videos that I use as my templates. Um, one of the videos could be like an intro video. Another video can be a behind the scenes video. Another video is more of like an educational or tip video. And then you have another video where you show your work and, um, let's say like the last video is kind of like a lifestyle, like more it's photography related, but more like influencer type and not so much like I'm a photographer here's my work it's more like here's me working you know so those are the different types of videos if you are someone that wants to get into TikTok I would recommend like mixing up those types of videos and I also forgot to mention that you can do trend videos as well so doing trends do those six different types of videos post them you know let's there's six days in a in a week kind of there's obviously seven days in a week but six days that you're going to post do a different type of video every single day, post at the same time. And I want you to observe like what videos perform well, why did they perform well? Um, I think it's really important to always be refining your content at the end of the day. The reason we put content out in the first place is so that we can get customers and, you know, run our businesses. But in order for your content to be seen correctly, you have to, play to the algorithm and you have to play the game of the app. So in doing this kind of like six video test, you can see what types of videos the app liked and what types of videos your audience liked, and then you can refine them. So if your audience really liked your tip video, your trend video, and your intro video, the next week you're going to go and you're going to do two intro videos, two tip videos, and two trends. So you keep refining your content and then you need to go in and like start to figure out what topics within those videos perform well. So if you're giving like tips for clients, let's say the topic of first looks and exits get the most views at that point, you know, like, okay, these topics are hitting home for my audience. Maybe it's a topic that people are interested in you're going to go and like keep posting videos with those topics mixed in. Um, You really, it's really just a matter of knowing what is popular as far as trends go and like the types of videos that are being shown on a for you page right now. 
and then knowing what type of your content can fit into what's popular right now on the app. Okay, I had no intentions of talking about social media. I don't know how I just got there, but I hope you liked that little tidbit of social media that you didn't ask for. Okay, let's get into talking about Flash. So like I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, I feel like my Flash journey has been like up and down and up and very down and very up. I just, my overall conclusion of Flash so far has been that Flash is so unreliable for the most part. Like, but I do think it depends on the Flash that you have. And that's something that I've learned is I had like this one type of Flash and it wasn't working for me. It was always dying. Then I got a different type of Flash and it was like, whoa, this is a game changer. Like, this flash is amazing. And then I got another flash and it was even better. So I think like the type of flash that you have really impacts how you feel about flash because a year ago I was like, I literally hate flash. So unreliable. I never know when it's going to die. I never know, you know, when it's actually going to recycle and work well. Um, so I've learned that rechargeable flashes. So flashes that have a rechargeable battery, Specifically, if it's like a lithium battery, those flashes are chef's kiss. Like, they're amazing. I love them. They have a pretty long, like, shoot life. I find that, you know, every, like, maybe three weddings, I have to, like, recharge my batteries, which that is incredible compared to this other flash that I had, like, a year or two ago. I literally had to replace the batteries in my flash, like, three times a night because it was using double A's. So rechargeable batteries in your flash, that is an absolute essential. Okay. Another thing is with your flash, you, you really need to like be careful with your hot shoe. So your hot shoe is that thing that connects the flash to your camera. It's like that. It's literally like a little horseshoe almost. And you just like slide your flash into it and then you lock it. You need to be so careful with your camera's hot shoe and then the hot shoe on your flash because it's literally like just like a little digital connection. And if any of those little prongs in there get messed up or whatever, you're literally going to have to either replace your hot shoe or get a whole new flash. So what I've learned is flashes come with these little covers for the hot shoes and your cameras come with little covers for your hot shoe. Use those. Okay. (laughs) I know it's like common knowledge to use the protection that like your gear comes with, but for some reason, I just never thought it was important. Also the pieces, the little hot shoe pieces are so small that I'm like, I lose these all the time. Like if we think losing lens caps is bad, wait until you see me try to find a hot shoe cover. They do not exist in my world. It is so, I've just spent so much time diligently thinking like, do not lose this. Remember you put this in your pocket, you know? So a hot shoe is super important. Protect them and use the covers. If you find that your flash isn't working properly, I would say don't blame it on the flash right away. It could be a hot shoe problem. I had a problem with my hot shoe. It was like a little over a year ago, maybe less than that. But basically this flash that I had every time I would put it on my camera, it would say um, like connection unstable or something like cannot connect properly to the camera. And I would be like, oh my gosh, this is the worst flash ever. Like I hate this flash. And it turns out it wasn't even a problem with my flash. It literally was a problem with the hot shoe because I wasn't using a cover for it. And then I would throw my flash around willy nilly. And one of the little prongs literally got moved and was like crooked. So it couldn't connect properly to my camera. Charlie ended up finding like a $20 hot shoe replacement piece and just like replacing my flash hot shoe for me. So there is like a very easy solution, but be careful. Okay. So let's talk about some moments that I've been using a flash lately. Um, so the main times that I use a flash, 
obviously like during a wedding I'm using a flash I also use a flash like during portraits and when I do you know just like things for fun I don't really find that I use a flash too often with clients it depends let me let me break this down for you guys so let's start with a wedding I'm using a flash obviously during the reception during dancing sometimes during speeches and dances if I need to Um, I use a flash sometimes during the getting ready portion of a wedding day. I do find that a lot of getting ready spaces are either dark or they have like windows, but windows that are like a little bit tricky. So I do find that bouncing a flash during the getting ready portion of a wedding is super helpful. Um, Another time I might use a flash during a wedding is during portraits if they have specified that they want a little bit more of like that film style of photography. So if that's the case, I will usually point my flash like directly forward and get some of those like filmy vibes. Another time I use my flash is for film inspired photos. So to kind of go along that, those lines, if I feel like I want trendy photos or I want to capture like a certain vibe whether that's like my client sent me inspo or like I have inspo in my head I have like a vision I will use direct flash so I'll point my flash directly forward I feel like when I'm bouncing my flash that's those are the moments where I want my flash to not really be noticed so I don't want someone to like see or like think like oh they use a flash for this like it's just supposed to be super natural and glowy but when I'm using my flash as direct flash and pointing it straight forward that's when I'm intentionally using the flash to get like a specific look and I do feel like that direct flash look is way more popular right now than it was like a year and a half ago so I am like definitely on this direct flash train I love it I feel like the photos turn out great the lighting is incredible I feel like direct flash is just so nice and like evenly lit and beautiful I feel like everyone's skin always glows when you have direct flash it's kind of like those like point and shoot little cheap cameras that we used to have as kids where you would pop the flash up and take photos like it gives you kind of like that look And I would encourage you if you're listening to this and you're still kind of like unsure about the direct flash world, take a day and go and use direct flash everywhere. Use it outside, use it inside, you know, use it in like all these different places like the shade, in the sun. I find that a lot of these like celebrity photos that I'm seeing use direct flash but almost in a way that you wouldn't really notice so like outside like I feel like a lot of celebrities just glow and they look amazing and it's because literally they're using flash all the time so I actually for the cover photo of my podcast we were taking photos in like this alleyway with like white brick walls and naturally like we were just using the light that was there but I was like you know, this is kind of dark. Let's try to use my flash. And the flash, I feel like just lit me up so well. And it was direct flash, but you, you didn't see like a shadow behind me or anything. Cause I had it at like a low power. So it wasn't supposed to be like a super intense flash. I just wanted like a little bit of a glow. So I would encourage you to mess around with direct flash. If you want to, I also use direct flash when I shot a wedding in October it was in South Carolina and at the end of the wedding the couple wanted to jump into the ocean so I used my direct flash for that and it did its job honestly I don't know how I would have been able to use direct flash or how no sorry I don't know how I would have been able to use the photos if I hadn't used direct flash like it was literally pitch black so sometimes if you're shooting in pitch black you gotta do what you gotta do whip out your flash that same wedding they did like their reception out on this balcony outside with just candles and it was so dark like the sun had gone down as pitch black and I did find that I had to use direct flash for that too so 
when you're using a flash, let's first talk about what you need to change on camera. Okay. So there's not much that needs to change, but as far as your camera settings go, if your flash doesn't, (laughs) your flash, if your camera doesn't like automatically set your shutter speed, when you put your flash on, you'll need to do this manually. Most of the time, your camera knows that your flash is connected and it'll automatically put your shutter speed where it needs to be. So typical shutter speeds for a flash are one over 60, one over 200 or one over 250. And that is on camera. That basically is how like the shutter speed that your camera needs to use. So how fast your shutter needs to open and close in order to be able to capture that flash of light that your flash is illuminating. Okay. So it's like making sure that your flash is synced up with your shutter. So your shutter actually captures the flash. I've had moments where I've used, um, off camera flash. So I've actually used a flash on like a light stand before. And I was finding that I was getting like a black curtain either at the top or the bottom of my photo. And that is literally your camera capturing your shutter closing and your shutter not having enough time to capture the full flash. So if you find yourself running into that issue, that is a shutter speed issue on your camera. The other things that I change on my camera when I put a flash on is I typically will bring my aperture up. I do find that the flash adds a light to your photo. That's kind of the whole point of using a flash, right? But with that, that means that you're going to need to add some darkness into your original settings. So if you were just shooting natural light, you know, your settings could be completely different. But because you're adding the flash into it, you're going to need to probably darken your image because your shutter speed is all the way at one over 200. Like that's very wide and it's going to let in a lot of light. So typically I will crank my aperture up. I typically shoot around F 2.0 or F 2.2. I find that when I'm using a flash, I'll usually bring it up to like F 2.8 or F 3.2. It does kind of depend on what I'm shooting, if it's like dancing reception photos, I'll crank my aperture a little bit higher because there's like more people. But if it's just like my couple or just like one person, then I'll kind of keep my aperture, you know, around like 2.8 or something still lower and still going to give me a little bit of that blur in the background, but I'm using a flash. So I need to be careful of my exposure. So ISO on your camera, you basically can just keep it at whatever looks good for exposure. Like I said, you're using a flash and you're adding in extra light into the image. Therefore, your ISO is probably going to need to be lower than what it was if you were shooting on natural light. So just keep that in mind. I do find that when I'm shooting direct flash, my ISO has to be as low as it can go. And my aperture too has to be like decently high, like 3.2 or you know, 3.5, which is not ideal for me, but literally sometimes you have no choice and the photos are just too bright. So that kind of transitions me into talking about your camera itself, because if you do find that your image is too bright, you could use flash settings to bring down the brightness of your flash. And we're going to talk through all of the different modes and everything too of your flash. So there's two different modes that we're going to talk about today. There is TTL mode on your camera, and then there's manual mode. I said on your camera, guys, I'm having such a hard time mixing up my words. There's TTL mode on your flash, and then there's manual mode on your flash. So these two different modes are basically the difference between auto and manual on your camera. So TTL mode is equivalent to the auto camera settings function. And then manual mode on your flash is equivalent to manual mode on your camera. I, when I'm talking to newer photographers and they tell me that they shoot in auto on their camera, I usually encourage people to shoot in manual. You know, you have full control over your images. However, when it comes to flash, 
that is like an extra added variable that sometimes is not worth the headache of shooting in manual mode. So if I'm going to be completely honest with you guys, on my flash, I am always using TTL mode. I'm always using the auto mode on my flash. And that's because I do not have the brain capacity while I'm shooting to not only worry about my camera's settings, but also my flash settings. Like, that's just a a lot for me. Like, that's six settings versus three settings that you have to worry about. So it's a little overwhelming, especially at a wedding, because a wedding is constantly changing. Like, the lighting is always changing, your focal length. And if I'm always having to get a million test shots and, like, figure out my perfect flash settings every time something changes, I'm extremely overwhelmed, okay? So because of that, I am shooting in TTL mode. TTL mode stands for through the lens. Very creative, right? (laughs) So basically what it means is your flash is analyzing what flash settings need to be through the lens of your camera. So it's like, analyzing the situation on your flash or through your lens on your flash and just it's making a decision for you essentially when your surroundings change your ttl mode settings will also change and i actually find that to be so helpful like i i don't feel like i have the ability to think about my flash settings at the same time that I'm thinking about my camera settings. So if I'm able to just rely on TTL mode to get good flash photos, and then I can worry about my camera settings, I feel like that really is like the best case scenario for me. However, if you're the the type of person that wants to try manual mode, we can try it. Let's, let's try it together. Here's gonna, here's going to be how you can try it. Okay. Cause I've, I've tried it before. So the first thing you need to know is there's like a, um, a fraction on your flash and it looks like shutter speed. Okay. So it's like one over 20 or one over 60 or one over one. Basically what that is, is it's actually your flash's power. So that fraction is telling you how powerful your flash is going to be. So the absolute lowest number, which is one over 64, is going to be the like least amount of light. So that's going to be the least amount of power is one over 64. The most power that your flash can give off is one over one. So that is like the most powerful full power setting in manual mode. Um, The thing to keep in mind with using a high power versus a low power is one, the brightness. So like how, how much flash and light does your subject actually need? Okay. Do you actually need to go to full power? And then the other thing to keep in mind is if you are using like a higher power on your flash, that means your flash batteries are going to die so much quicker. And, you know, the more power you're using, the less reliable your flash battery is going to be. And also, like, if your battery is lower and, like, if it's using more battery, it's going to take more recycle time as well. And if you don't know what recycle time is on a flash, that's basically how quickly your flash can go from taking one photo to then taking a second shot. So um, a lot of the times a flash will have to like recycle and like, re- like basically like you take a photo, it needs a minute before you can take another photo. And you're going to find that that time that it takes to be ready to take another photo is going to be longer if you're using a higher power. So keep that in mind. Like obviously the more you use your flash, the slower your recycle time gets naturally just as you're using your flash your battery power and like battery life goes down but you're going to increase your chances of your recycle time being less and less if you are using less power or more power sorry if you're using more power okay so the other thing on manual mode on your flash is aperture so (laughs) aperture is a little confusing when it comes to flash So basically, 
your aperture number on your camera determines how much how much your flash needs to emit light. Um, so if you let's start with the basics of like what is aperture actually. So aperture is the opening in your lens. So the hole that light travels through is your aperture. So the wider your aperture, the lower the number. So f 1.4, that is like the basically the widest aperture and more light gets let in because of that. As your aperture gets smaller and smaller and as you get to like f5 and f8, you know, that hole becomes smaller and smaller. And if your aperture is at F8, that's a small hole compared to F1.4. Therefore, because the hole is smaller, your flash needs to let more light out and it needs to be more powerful in, in order to get enough light through your aperture hole. You know, it's like the smaller the aperture hole, the more your flash is doing okay the more work it's doing so this is an interesting thing to think about because when you're setting your manual flash settings in manual mode you need to think about the power just like the shutter number and then also like the aperture number as well if you really want to just play it safe you can set your aperture on your flash to whatever it is on your camera and then just mess around with that power number so that fraction is really like the only thing you mess around with the other thing when it comes to manual mode on your flash is focal length and your flash will literally ask you like what focal length are you shooting on and the reason it asks you this is because your focal length impacts how how much your flash needs to disperse light. Um, So the best way I can explain this is if you're shooting on, let's say a 200 millimeter lens, that's really, really wide. And because it's so wide and such a far focal length, your flash needs to distribute light like more. (laughs) I don't even know how to explain this. I also, you know what? Let me just look this up to double check that I understand this correctly because I think the reason I'm not fully able to explain the focal length thing is because I don't know if I fully know if this is correct or not so let me look this up real quick okay so we have an answer okay (laughs) I'm actually just gonna read this directly from Google because I do think this like very accurately describes why I was trying to describe So flash focal length determines the area over which the flash will spread out. If your lens is zoomed in and the flash is zoomed out, so if your lens is at 200 and your flash is at 35, a lot of light will be wasted on your environment that will not be visible in the photo. Okay, so what I was going to say is accurate. I just wanted to make sure that I was like actually on the right track because flash confuses me guys. Okay. Like this is confusing for all of us. So your focal length on your flash when you're in manual mode, basically like the longer your lens is. So let's say it's at 200, your flash is going to send out a concentrated amount of light, kind of more focused on the center of your focal length because it doesn't need to distribute that flash everywhere because you're shooting on a 200, which means you're really only capturing a small portion of what's in front of you. Therefore the light's going to be more concentrated in one area. But if you're shooting at something really wide, like a 24 millimeter, your flash is going to need to distribute that light everywhere, you know, cause a 24 is really wide. You're taking photos of like everything basically. So because of that, your flash needs to distribute light like from left to right completely, not just concentrated in one area in front of you. So that's what the focal length means on your flash. Common knowledge and common sense says to just set your focal length to whatever your focal length is on your camera. Like there's really no reason to set it to anything different unless you have a very specific look that you're going for where you want your flash super concentrated in the middle and maybe not. I don't, I don't know. 
I don't really see why you would set your focal length to anything else, but you can, you know, it's manual mode. You can do whatever the heck you want. So those are the three different areas of manual mode on a flash. Okay. There's the power. So the fraction number, there's your aperture and your focal length. Okay. And what I'm going to say, like I said this earlier, I just feel like flash is so, it changes so much. If someone's like five feet away from you versus seven feet away from you, your flash is going to need to be a little bit brighter. And I feel like I just don't have the quick thinking to change my settings like on my flash, depending on like what's in front of me. I just, my brain is not there yet. So for me, TTL mode is the best option. Um, So let's talk about bouncing or direct flash. So I kind of talked about this earlier, but when you are bouncing your flash, I want you to picture the flash as let's say just like a streamer. Okay. Like just to make it easier for you to understand your flash when it's pointed, let's say directly at the ceiling, that streamer is going up to the ceiling and then it's going to hit that ceiling depending on the color of the ceiling and it's going to distribute downward. Okay. Because light is how it is. Light can evenly distribute and bounce off of white surfaces. So if you are bouncing a flash, you want to make sure you have a white surface to bounce your flash off of. Otherwise you might run into some issues. I've run into issues with this before 100%. So I have shot at like these barns it's always a barn, literally. And it's like a dark wood barn and all of the walls are dark wood. And then in barns, ceilings are also wood. So I have shot in these barns where they're literally like the darkest environment to ever exist on the face of the planet. And I cannot bounce my flash. Okay. Because it's a a literal dark brown surface. Like light does not bounce off of that. Light just gets sucked into dark surfaces. So if that's the case and you like are shooting in an area where you can't bounce your flash, two recommendations. One is try to use a white card. If your flash has like a little thing, you can pull it out of your flash. It's literally like a white card and you can bounce your flash kind of off of this card and direct your flash a little bit. So in this dark barn venue that I was shooting at, I actually used my white card and kind of pointed my flash it was like so it wasn't straight up it wasn't directly forward it was kind of in between straight up to the sky and directly forward and then my my white card kind of bounced that flash downward so it was a mix between direct flash and bouncing so it was it was kind of a weird look but it was better than literally having like no light on my subjects at all so that is bouncing your flash I do find that if you bounce your flash and you find yourself switching between landscape and portrait frequently, you're going to have to move your flash around and like constantly be changing your flash. So when you switch orientations, you have to switch your flash and have it point back up at the ceiling. It is a little annoying, but if you can like get in the hang of it and just make it a habit, I literally just like switch my flash all the time and it's like, I don't even think about it anymore, but it is going to be something that you're going to have to like intentionally do when you first start bouncing your flash. I also talked about this earlier when I'm using direct flash, it's always for the vibe. Okay. Like it's always for my film vibe or like, it's like always a trendy vibe. I do want to talk very briefly about, um, shutter drag, which I did not mention. And, I don't know if I've talked about shutter drag very often on this podcast, but basically shutter drag is, it's like a method of using your flash specifically. It's really popular during like a reception at a wedding, but essentially you are leaving your lens open longer than your flash goes off. And essentially it's capturing your flash. And then it's also capturing the external lights that are in the environment that you're in. So there's, there's two phases of shutter drag. Okay. The first is 
well, okay. Let me first explain like this, your camera settings. Basically your camera needs to be set at a shutter at like one over 20 or something, which is very low. And you know, the average shutter speed for using a flash is like one over 200. So basically you are saying, I want my shutter to stay open longer, even though my flash is going off in like a quick second. And like, I still want my shutter to stay open. Okay. When you do that, there's two different parts of the photo taking process. The first part is your camera is going to capture the flash going off. So it's going to freeze your subjects in place. Okay. The second half of the photo taking process is going to be the remaining time that your shutter is open. And what it's doing is it's capturing all of the ambient light in the room, just like if there's a lamp or string lights, like that's what it's capturing. So when you are doing shutter drag, you are allowing yourself to freeze your subjects in place, but also get like slow motion, like light leaks. So a lot of the time when you're doing shutter drag, um, I'll press my shutter and then I'll very quickly like swing my camera in a sweeping motion. So then these light leaks kind of like sweep across my image. It's it's kind of an art form, to be honest. Like, obviously, all of photography is art, but like, shutter drag is like a whole different level of art. Like, it's it's very intentional. And if you mess it up, like, if you shutter drag in the wrong direction and like cover your subject's face, you're toast. Like, it, it, you really have to be so intentional with shutter drag. The other thing with shutter drag is w- with your shutter having to be so low. So I mentioned like one over 20 because of that, your aperture has to be like through the roof. Like I find that my aperture is like at F 10 when I'm doing shutter drag and my ISO is at its absolute lowest, which is, you know, 100 or 50 or whatever. So keep that in mind. Shutter drag is so fun though. If you've never tried it, literally like at night, turn on a lamp in your house and mess around with shutter drag settings and like take a photo of something and then sweep your camera in a sweeping motion. It is so fun. And I feel like it really creates this like party vibe. I do feel like that's why a lot of photographers, specifically wedding photographers will use shutter drag. It's just like, it's such a fun vibe. So two other things I want to talk about. One is flash diffusers. So in my like year, two years updating this flash episode, I have discovered the art of a flash diffuser. And I discovered this recently when I got my new flash, but basically it's like this thing. It's like a little globe that goes on top of your flash and basically diffuses your flash for you. So it's not as like strong and intense. It's like much more soft. And this can be so nice when you're doing direct flash because it just like diffuses the light. And my flash diffuser that I have actually just came with my flash. So I bought the Godox V1 flash and they have like all different types of this flash for Sony, Nikon, Canon, whatever you have. So I have the flash for Sony And it came with like a kit of like different colors. So it had like a red and a blue. And they're just like these little like translucent pieces of paper that you can put over your flash if you want like a specific color on your subject. But I found that it came with like this little globe and it just attaches right onto my camera. And it really gives me like a super nice and diffused look, which... I can appreciate. So if you are new to the whole flash world or you, you feel like your flash is a little bit too intense, you want a softer look, I would recommend like literally go on Amazon and find like these little boxes that can go over your flash or these little globes. They're super helpful. And I do feel like they're almost the secret sauce for using flash. There's a lot of secret sauces, but I do think that a flash diffuser is a huge thing when it comes to using your flash and just having it look a little bit more natural. Okay. I have literally exhausted my brain on this topic. I think I've said the word flash like a hundred times. Like truly I am 
my brain is fried. So I need to end this episode here before I start saying nonsense that doesn't make any sense. Thank you guys so much for listening to today's episode. I am so happy that you guys have been liking the podcast so far. And if you liked this episode specifically, I would love for you to leave me a review or, you know, just DM me. Let me know how you feel about it. Repost it to your story, whatever. Um, But if you don't do any of that, guys, I'm just glad that you're here. Thank you so much for listening to the end. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their day.